the Toyota Igo Cross. And up until today, I was calling it an Igo X. I wonder how many of you were too. In that way, it sort of reminds me of the old Ford Ka. Everyone ended up calling it a Ka because Ka really isn't an English word unless you're doing martial arts. Anyway, none of that matters. What does matter is that this is a city car and there's not many of those left and it's from Toyota, so it's quite important. So I'm gonna review it, starting with the looks. This is in juniper blue. To my eyes, it has a hint of purple, although I don't think it comes across on camera. And this is what it looks like from the front. You can see some black plastic trim here to try and make it look like a crossover. And that may be where the name's coming from. This is the side, it's 152 centimetres tall, that's about 5 feet, and 3.7 metres long, that's about 12 feet. It's 24 centimetres longer than the previous model, that much. So the previous model would have ended there, not that much bigger then. They all get five doors, so doors at the back, no three door model available, and they all have 18 inch alloy wheels, apart from the base model which gets 17 inch wheels. That's big for this size of car. And this is the rear. Notice how the boot lid is just one piece of glass. That was the same on the original iGo. It makes it cheaper to make and cheaper to fix if it gets damaged. So in theory, cheaper to insure. To open the boot, you press this button here and you're greeted with 231 liters of space and a little light there. You have a flimsy parcel shelf. I'll take that off now, one-handed using my left hand, even though I'm right-handed. This one's gonna be a bit more tricky. Elast a little elastic bits of string. And then because it's quite flimsy, you can just put it there and put stuff on top. To lower the rear seat, you pull these white tabs, and then you have 800, this one's stuck, there it is, 829 liters of space. Also, I wanna show you, you have handy little things here to put the seat belt in so that the seats don't snag on the belt when you lower it. There is only one engine available, a one litre three cylinder petrol with 72 horsepower and 93 newton metres of torque. It does 55 miles per gallon, give or take, depending on the trim you get because having different size wheels can affect economy and you can get it with either a five speed manual or a CVT automatic. For performance, they're very similar. The manual does zero to 60 in 14.9 seconds and the automatic does it in 14.8 but the manual has a top speed of 98 miles an hour and the CVT automatic has a top speed of 94. What is interesting though, is that according to the literature, during the drive by sound test, the CVT auto was two decibels louder and you do notice two decibels. Now I'm gonna see how easy it is to get in the rear and how comfortable it is back there. The rear door opens that far, that's as far as it goes. That's not very wide, if you weren't very able you wouldn't want to be squeezing in there. I'm going to hop in now. Oh, I just hit my bum on that bit. And I have no knee room. Like, it's not like my knees are squished, but there's no extra room for my fingers here. Although, it's not that bad. I can fit my feet underneath the seat in front. This seat is set in my driving position. I'm five foot 10, that's 178 centimeters. Longer in the torso than I am the leg. But this thing here is digging into my back. I'll just make that higher and see if it's comfortable. Oh yes, it's quite a comfy seat. One cup holder in the middle, only two seats back here, so it's a four seat car, no central armrest, which is normal in a city car. No lights at the top back here, again, that's normal in a city car, and no cup holders here. This is all plastic, some painted metal. The rear windows don't go down, but you can pop them out. Rear visibility, Actually, not too bad. I can see to the left and to the right, so that's gonna help with car sickness, but it could be better if this seat wasn't one piece and it was a separate headrest because then I could see under the headrest, which can help a little bit when it comes to visibility. Now for the front, the door opens that wide. That's a lot of space. This will be easy. I can hop in there, no problem. This seat is set in my driving position. I move all the way back. And I could still drive it, although it would be a stretch. So if you're particularly tall, try this before you buy it. Now I'll go all the way forwards, if I can. There we go. And between the front of my seat and the brake pedal, it's about the length of my foot. That's normal. And I'm a size eight. Get it back where I want. 
All iGo crosses have a height adjustable driver's seat. I'll go down to the bottom first. Well, I was near the bottom and I have just over two hands worth of space between my head and the roof. To the top, that's a lot of adjustment. Hmm. Oh, still going. And I have about three fingers worth of space. I'll put it back where I want and the steering wheel. Nope, that does not go in and out, but it does go up and down about an average amount. What is good though, is where the seat is in relation to the steering wheel and the pedals and how high the pedals are off the floor and where the gear stick is. This is a comfortable driving position. I don't feel twisted and I don't feel like I'm stretching for anything. I feel like I could sit here for a long time. I forgot to mention the backrest. It's the wheel type for adjustment, not a lever type. So you can't go backwards and forwards quickly, but you can infinitely adjust it to exactly where you want, which is nice. I'm now gonna show you the interior of the car, starting with this door. This is hard plastic, some body colored metal here, the same as outside. Silver plastic door handle, electric windows. Nope, no one touch. You do have to hold it down to go down. Yep, and hold it up to go up. Electric mirrors, door bin, decent size. This bit does feel flimsy. You can see a gap there and you can sort of push it and it does flex a little bit. Buttons, height adjustment for the lights, auto high beams, that's good to see. Stability control, auto stop start, and there is the bonnet release. Some plastic here, but in body colored. Adjust the air vent like so, or twist it and up and down, or you can turn it off like that. An air vent here for the window. That looks like a speaker. I can't find any in the back, but there is one down here. So the four speakers, both of them, or should I say all four of them are at the front. So both of them, two on this side and two on that side. If you're familiar with Toyota, you'll recognize this steering wheel and these stalks. They're nice to use, very pleasing. Well damped, high quality, and well laid out buttons. There's a 4.1 inch screen, I believe, colored screen here, which has a lot of functions on it for your speed, your economy, and your music. You can look at your media, your cruise control, etc. And an analog speedo, rev counter, and fuel. Everything here is firm plastic, as you would expect in a city car, but I do feel the Kia Picanto is of higher quality. I'll leave a link to my review of that car on screen if you're interested. There's no air vent at the front, but there is this air vent up here, which does point forwards, but you can't adjust it, just one, and obviously the side ones. That is not for the window though, there is another window one just there. Coming down, we've got the screen, some gloss black plastic, the screen, this is an eight inch one, responsive, high enough resolution, quite nice to use, and you have some knobs as well and buttons, which makes it easier. Climate control on this one, although you can have manual air conditioning. 12 volt socket, USB port for Android Auto. This is a big phone, a Pixel 6, and it doesn't fit in there, although it would if it had an angled USB socket there or plug, but I don't have one at the moment. Underneath, if I can get you to see that, there is like a texture there to try and make it more grippy. Certainly more grippy than this stuff, but it's not rubber. Two cup holders for half litre bottle, they work. Gear stick, handbrake, glove box, is it damped? No, so let that down gently if I was you. Half decent size for this size of car. Are there lights? No, but there are mirrors. Oops. Oh yeah, obviously that comes out to do that, but actually I do find, that's the second time that's happened to me, it happened when I was driving, they're quite stiff, these um, sun visors, so when you go to put it up, it comes out of that, better do it on that side nearer that hinge, and then it goes up. Black roof lining, this one though, has, if I press this button, a canvas roof, how sweet is that? Just under 900 pound option. I believe 895, if I've got that wrong, I'll put it on screen. And then you have to hold the button down to get it to go back. It's not automatic on the way back. And then obviously a light here, or you have to do it again, get it to go all the way. The SOS button as well, just there. This is not auto dimming. I couldn't find one that was, all of them have manual um, 
interior mirrors for the night mode, not automatic night mode. And I think that's about it. Lovely driving position though. I do like sitting here. Oh, and I think this is quite important. The fuel release, well, it's down here, just in front of the seat, there. I'm gonna quickly go over the trims and what you get for your money. There are four levels. Pure being the base level, £15,975, although it doesn't feel like a base model. A lot here, 17 inch alloys, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, reverse camera, adaptive cruise control and lane guidance, all the iGo crosses. I nearly said iGo X, I stopped myself from doing it. Get adaptive cruise control and the automatic steering. Brilliant that Toyota fit that to, I think, all of their cars now as standard. It's called Toyota Safety Sense and it's, uh, it has other safety features as well. Road sign assist, manual air conditioning, a lever, steering wheel and gear knob. So it doesn't matter which I go cross you go for, the steering wheel and the gear knob does feel good. Seven inch main screen and a 4.2 inch central instrument cluster. So I said it was 4.1 earlier, but it's 4.2. Close enough, I think. I'll give myself that one. And a height adjustable driver's seat across the range. Move up to the edge, 1,000. £110 more please, £17,085. I think this is probably the best value. This is what this car is. So the Edge gets 18 inch alloys, an eight inch main screen, privacy glass, auto wipers, they all get auto lights anyway, climate control, a gloss black front grille and LED daytime lights. So it will look a bit fancier at the front. The two top spec models now, the two top, exclusive or air edition. The exclusive is more about equipment and the air edition is more about style. So exclusive is £1,810 more than this one, than the Edge, but you do get bitone metallic paint included, which is worth £590. So it's not as much more money as you think, especially if you're gonna pay for paint on the Edge. So the exclusive, nine inch main screen, wireless charger, wireless Apple CarPlay, wireless Android Auto, front and rear parking sensors, part fake leather seats, keyless entry, LED projector headlights, ambient lighting, and your choice of four colors, your four bitone colors included in the price of the exclusive, and emergency steering assist. If you wanted to go for the Air Edition, it's a bit more money. It's £470 more than the exclusive or £2,280 more than the Edge, coming in at £19,365. You do miss out on some of the things that the exclusive has though. You don't get wireless charger, you don't get the nine inch screen or wireless CarPlay and Android Auto, but you do get the canvas roof included and matte colored wheels with body colored inserts. Also, you get the front and rear parking sensors still, but you do miss out on ambient lighting, um, LED projector headlights, I believe, and the emergency steering assist. I have to check that actually. I'm not sure if you do get the LED projector headlights with the air edition. I'll put it on screen though. If you want an automatic, it's £1,100 more for the CVT. This one is the iGo Edge. It has the parking pack for 295, so it does get front and rear parking sensors, not standard with the edge, the middle spec. A canvas roof at 895 pounds and the Juniper blue paint at 590, coming into a total of 18,865 pounds. If it was my money, I would probably be getting the edge or the exclusive. Hard choice for me, that one. I'm gonna start the driving with maneuvering. So reverse, hold the clutch down for a couple of seconds, and then to the right and back. I don't need to push the gear stick down or up to select reverse, and I hold the clutch down for a couple of seconds just to make sure there's no grinding of the gears as I select reverse, as there can be with these kinds of gearboxes if you do it too quickly. So, foot on the brake, handbrake off. Let's see if it will allow me to move without pressing the gas. Have reversing camera, they all get that, that's handy. Yes, it does. and. Uh, Gonna go quite quick. No, it will stall. You do need to press gas if you wanna get going quick. It doesn't give you too much help, that's better. But for moving very slowly, you can get away with just lifting the clutch. The engine is struggling a little bit. What about on the way forwards? 
so first gear and it gives you a similar amount of help steering's very light visibility out the back not too bad fairly big c pillars decent sized wing mirrors so i can see either side of me the wing mirrors don't automatically dip when i put it into reverse this car has the optional front and rear parking sensors let's test them out so i go near the wall behind turning circles 9.4 meters i believe very small and it comes up here which i think is great and oh we'll actually go very close before it goes into what i call a flat line beep i don't actually want to get much closer than that so it allows you to get very close to what you want to get close to before it actually goes beep what about the front ones you know i was proper close to that wall let's try out the front ones on this wall there we go and yeah, I don't want to get much closer than this either. They're the most risky reverse sensors I've ever tried. In fact, I'm going to try that now and show you how close it is. So this is how close you are to the wall when the sensors go beep. That's a bit closer than usual. Can I open the boot? That'll be interesting. Is there room or is it going to hit the... No. Nope. Oh, just about. Careful there. Yes, yeah, so you can just about open the boot when the reverse sensors flat line. So, turning circle. I said it's about 9.4 meters. Let's see how that feels. So I'll give it some gas to help me go. Steering, one turn, one and a half turns almost to go fully turned. And yes, that's a brilliant turning circle. And yeah, the steering is incredibly light. You can always fling it round. An easy car to park. Out of town roads now in a 40 limit. Will be a 60 limit soon. Easy to rev match, reset the trip computer, that button there. See what the economy's like. It's a second gear up to 40. Well, that does feel fairly slow. The gearing feels long for the power. There's not much difference between quarter throttle and full throttle. What about the cornering now on that corner? Oh, feels okay. It's flat, it's smooth, comfortable ride. Brilliant driving position, I've already said it, but that is my favorite thing about this car. What does worry me are the tires. They're 18 inch, but 175, 60, 18, that's a weird size. So they're probably gonna be quite expensive. I'll put some prices on screen now. In fact, I did have a look and I think Michelin's were 140, no, they're 177. That's a lot for a Michelin on a little car. And these are Falcon on this, and they were like 125. I'll put it on screen though. Anyway, national speed limit. Down into second. Come on. 50 miles an hour before I need to slow down for the bend. Feels like it will do 60 miles an hour in second, which is too long for a car this power. But the sound. <laughs> yes. I like this three cylinder engine. It's not powerful, but I find this car a lot of fun makes you want to drive it you got to well this car will make you a good manual driver because you have to use those gears you need to multiply the torque with the gears and rev the engine to get going there we go 60 miles an hour in in second gear if it was shorter geared it would be a lot more punchy or not punchy i shouldn't say that it wouldn't be punchy but it'd be nippier it'd be faster and it would be more fun because you could change gear more often and hear the sound of that engine. But that bump there, oh, 50 miles, that was good. Very controlled. I have to say, I do like this car, for driving at least on country roads. I'll finish the country road route I do into a 30 now, and then I'll tell you the economy and I'll do a launch before I finish as well. Just done most of the country route now, on the way back, and there's no one behind, so I can stop and do the launch. First gear, no driving modes. I am the driving mode. I'm not sure how hard to be with the gas, but you know, it's my first time launching this. What's that? I'll say about that, and go. Come on, go, go. I bogged down, wasn't the best start. Come on. Oh, 35 miles an hour in first gear. Very long gear. No wonder why I bogged down 
and I know it goes to 60 in a second and yeah it's just about 60 there before I'm braking for the bend not sure what time that was supposed to be 14.9 seconds to 60 it does feel like it steering is a little bit light gas pedal is nice brake pedal is gorgeous not too sensitive at the top but also no dead space um, so it's not grabby but also when you press it it doesn't make you feel like it's not working it, it works nicely and progressively the clutch a little bit higher than I'm used to when I've gone to move away on a couple of occasions I've given a bit too many revs just because the clutch is quite high it's beyond halfway to get it going which is not what I'm used to most cars are about halfway but it's a light pedal and there isn't too much travel and if you're interested in rev matching yep easy enough and it does handle well and it sounds good for a city car I'll give this a and for, for everything being considered I'll give this an eight and a half out of ten on the country roads how smooth no no I'm making it a nine I'm making it a nine. just for how smooth is a pothole there that was smooth that was nice that was not a nice pothole it would be a 10 if it had shorter gearing that's what it needs and I reckon it's because of emission laws and making it more economical is why the gears are longer but what's happening is I'm just leaving it in lower gears more often to have more power available I really like how this gear stick is so close to the steering wheel I can touch the gear stick and the steering wheel at the same time it's high up so there is actually quite a lot of throw as it's long there's a lot of travel but the notch that it gives you when you push it into gear it feels quality it's satisfying and it's positive as well all right let's pull over and see what it's done so economy whoa 46.6 miles per gallon on that run given how i was driving it it's not a hybrid just a one liter manual petrol that's done very well to get over 40 is good to get 46 I'm impressed with that now urban roads the traffic is horrendous today but I'm still getting over 40 miles to the gallon even though I've been stuck here for a little while it was over 60 before I hit the traffic but I was going downhill a little bit it'll be interesting to see what the final economy figure is but whatever it is I'd expect to normally get more. I do like the stop start system. When it cuts out, it's smooth. And when it cuts in, it's smooth. You can hear it cough into life, but it doesn't vibrate the car. Uh, the car does have hill hold assist. I just used it there. And the three cylinder engine is quite smooth. When you're sitting idling and the stop start isn't turning the engine off, there's not much vibration going through the car. There's more than a four cylinder, but it's subtle. It's definitely not a problem. But usually, the stop-start kits in and turns off anyway, turns the engine off, so you don't feel anything at all. Visibility out the side is pretty good because the window sill is low. Out the front, the scuttle is a bit high, so it does make you feel like you're driving a bigger car than you are, which is probably why I keep stopping a bit far back from things and why the parking sensors were making me feel a bit nervous earlier. I was thinking, oh, I'm way too close to that wall, but I don't think I was as close as it felt. The window sill here at the front is higher than I'm used to. These pillars, they could be smaller here. Not a bad thickness, they're not too thick, but sometimes manufacturers put the door mirror lower down on the door so you don't have this bit of plastic here. That's how it is with my Say It Lay On and I get better visibility lower down here at junctions. But it's definitely not a deal breaker. A slight move of the head solves the problem getting close to the end of my urban route now and I've been very impressed with the ride quality of this car not only on the rural roads but on these urban roads it's smooth it feels planted it feels like a bigger car but in a good way because bigger cars generally have a better ride I find also it doesn't tram line and follow the road it stays in a straight line so I don't have to keep adjusting the steering the adaptive cruise control there was just uh, slowing down for the car in front a bit early I felt I forgot that it was on actually I knew the cruise control was on but I forgot it was the adaptive system so the car in front started slowing down it's still quite far away and it was braking without me expecting it to 
but you do have the choice of having adaptive cruise or normal cruise. I'll try this system out when I get onto the 70 mile an hour road. 44.3 miles per gallon. Very impressed with the fuel economy this car is giving me, especially given that traffic. Amazed it's got over 40. I was stuck in that traffic for a good five minutes and it's not the longest of routes. So it was a, a significant proportion of the time. Yeah, at the roundabout, visibility is fine. This pillar's not causing me a problem. Well, that was some of the worst traffic I've experienced in Colchester for a while, yet it's still got 44.7 miles per gallon, which is seriously impressive. If the traffic was normal, I'm sure it would get over 50 miles to the gallon. Now, for the 70 mile an hour roads. I'm impressed with the lack of road noise. This is a noisy road and it's not that noisy in here. I think this is the quietest city car I have been in and I can't hear much in the way of wind noise either. I'm doing 70 miles an hour with the adaptive cruise on and the lane trace assist. It's actually doing a good job of keeping me in this lane. I think it's doing a better job than other Toyotas that I've driven. Can I change the sensitivity of this auto wipers? I can, so not quite sensitive enough, that's better. If that car, this van, if it pulls in front of me, be interesting if it does to see how this cruise control reacts. Are they gonna pull in? Yes, they are. Let's see if it slams on the brakes or see if it's sensible. Oh, it's sensible, good, because it will, it will keep a bigger distance than that, but it's not slamming on the brakes when the car goes in front of me. It's gonna slow down gradually and let that gap gradually and safely improve. I'm surprised how well the steering system is working. A lot of systems, including the one in the Yaris, it does bounce from left to right a little bit. This one seems better. I guess this has a later system. I've got 50 coming up now, so I need to slow down. So I'm not breaking the law. That's 50 and 58.5 miles per gallon. I'm really impressed with the economy of this car. So I'm catching a car now, adaptive cruise control is on. Let's see how it reacts. It's slowing down, feels like it's applying the brakes. It doesn't feel like it's just letting off the power. That was quite comfortable. Wasn't too late or urgent. I would have done it a little bit more gently, but for one of these systems, it's one of the better ones. Now I've changed lane and it's accelerating back up to 70 miles per hour. Let's see what the revs are like at 70. It's hard to judge this uh, tachometer, the rev counter. I would say that looks like it's about three and a half thousand, but you barely hear the engine. I'm hearing a bit more wind noise this time going back in the other direction. And I think that's because obviously the wind might be coming towards me here but still, this is a quiet city car on these roads. Trucks pulling out in front of me and then the adaptive cruise control has braked and it is letting the gap grow gradually. Very well done. I was covering the brake the whole time. The system didn't overreact. It wasn't dangerous, but it did react and it then it did start to increase my distance between me and that truck to increase safety instead of staying there. So it did very well. Coming to the end of the 70 mile per hour route now, I've done 57.5 miles per gallon and I was doing 70 miles an hour most of the way. I'm not slowing down at the moment, the car is. It's doing it more or less as I would. I think I'll turn the system off soon, but I'm quite happy with what it's doing. As I need the left lane, I'm a bit afraid the car will start accelerating now. It sees my lane is clear. Is it gonna do that? Yeah, it is. So I'll just turn it off now because I do have a red light up there. I don't wanna accelerate towards that red light. Yeah, after the slip road, 59 miles per gallon. And look at this traffic. What is up with the roads today? That road I was on is normally quiet and that was busy today. I think it's worth noting that Toyota Fit, adaptive cruise control and lane trace assist, that's the assistant that helps you stay in lane when you're driving, as standard across their range in Great Britain. I can't think of a car they sell in Great Britain. I might be wrong, but I can't think of one that doesn't have those systems for free. Okay, it's not for free, you have to buy the car, but you don't have to pay extra for it. And it really makes a difference on long journeys, having that adaptive cruise control. Lane trace assist, not as much, but on a car at this price point, not having to pay extra for that, that surprises me. 
Also, another thing worth mentioning, Toyota now offer a 10 year warranty. How good is that? If you service your car at Toyota, they give you a year's warranty for every service or 10,000 miles, whatever comes soonest, up until the car is 10 years old or has 100,000 miles on it. And if you service the car when it's one day short of being 10 years old, nine years old and 364 days, they still give you the year. Or it's got 99,999 miles in it, as long as it's less than 10 years old, they will still give you 10,000 miles of warranty at that mileage. That's remarkable. That's a long time. So to sum up the Toyota iGo Cross, at 70 miles per hour, it's far better than it has any right to be. It feels like a much more expensive car on those roads. On country roads, it's fun, although it would be better if it had a closer ratio six-speed gearbox, but it's still good. Around town, as you expect, it's a city car. It's good around town. It's got a small turning circle and it's very economical. It's also a lot more comfortable than I expected. The interior quality, well, a city car, it's not gonna be the best, but it's acceptable, is what I'd expect from this price point, although it's not the best in class. But ownership proposition, well, Toyota, they often come out top or near top of reliability surveys, and they're confident enough now to offer a 10 year warranty. So that's saying something. So this is a car you can buy with your head. Definitely you can buy it with your head, but you can also buy it with your heart a little bit if you enjoy driving a manual car on country roads. If you found the video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to get my future videos. And until the next one, cheerio.